we're going to start going live very soon. I'm Fiona, the treasurer of the History of Art Society this year. Um, a bit about me, I'm, a, I'm going into my fourth year and I'm a MAPA student, so that means I also do studio art. I mostly do painting. I'm not sure what that means this year, but we'll see. So I think we're ready to start. So we're going to start by, I'm going to play you a little video about how to make a French 75. Tonight, along with our presentations, we also have cocktails through the ages, the French 75 past, present, future. These recipes were created by our lovely uh, past history of art president, Apollonia, who is here in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to play you that video real quick. Sorry guys, just some technical difficulties. Uh, give me one second, I'll play you the correct video this time. Hello, this evening we'll be making a French 75. You'll need gin, Simple syrup, lemon juice, prosecco, ice. Start by filling your shaker full of ice. Then add 20 milliliters of gin. Into the shaker. And 20 milliliters of simple syrup, which we made before. This stuff is real sticky, be careful. Into the shaker. And 10 milliliters of fresh. Please do not use store bought lemon juice. It is just. Taste nearly as good. Please squeeze your own lemon juice. I promise it's not that difficult. If you don't have a cute lemon juicer like this, you're welcome to just use a fork over a glass to squeeze all that lemon juice in. Then measure 10 milliliters of lemon juice. Now add the top. Shake all of it together. Make sure your ice is in there. Make sure you hold on to both sides so it doesn't go exploding. The French 75 takes its name from the 75 millimeter cannon, a mainstay of French artillery during World War I. The Soissons cans, as they called it, was a symbol of hope in the battle against Germany. The drink, the French 75, was probably first made in 1914 at Henry's Bar in Paris, France. And this strong drink, just like its namesake, can knock you on your ass. Shake for approximately 20 seconds or until your shaker is too cold to hold. Then we'll strain it into a martini glass, a coupe, or a flute glass. Here's my little strainer. And then we'll top our cocktail off with a little bit of Prosecco. And a little lemon twist just to add garnish. And here is 
is our classic French 75. Cheers. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed that little cocktail recipe. We'll be posting those videos on our YouTube channel later, so if you want to look back at them, that's what we're all drinking tonight, a French 75. So let me let some more people into the Zoom. Welcome to these new people. Welcome Izzy and uh, Zofia and Millie, welcome. Please mute yourself if you've just joined. Um, so you haven't missed too much yet. We're just about to start our first presentation about the past of art history. Then later tonight, you'll hear about the present and the future. Oh, one more person to admit. I like how everyone's showing fashion, showing up fashionably late. Um, welcome, Rosie. Please mute yourself once you enter the meeting. And just so everyone knows, uh, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to introduce um, our first uh, lovely presenter, uh, Megan. So I'll just share the screen so you can see her slides. Hi guys, um, I'm going to be doing, I'm, my name's Megan, and I'm going to be doing the um, past of art history, which I'm not going to lie, is a pretty big topic, that, that covers everything basically, so I'm going to be doing like an A to Z of um, the past and try and get through as many topics as I can, and hopefully it's not too overwhelming for everyone, but there's too much stuff going on, so... So A, a classic um, ancient Greece, you've got to have that. Um, mainly sculpture, pottery, architecture, three main periods for ancient Greece. Um, ar archaic, classical and Hellenistic. Um, they pretty much focus on the same like sculptures and architecture and things like that. You've all seen the beautiful sculptures that they did. Um, they were, they went from being really rigid, not a lot of expression to like, um, displaying like Greek gods and sculpture and like and then um, posture and action and things so very like it very transformed in that time and then in the Hellenistic period they conquered loads of um, places like Asia and their art was like influenced by culture and different people from all around the world um, <laughs> pottery was the highest like one of the highest art forms in um, in the Greek period um, I don't know if you can see that. Oh yeah. Um, so that is the Greek period. Very, very dramatic. They love their warriors. They love their gods. They are all on that. Um, for B, hang on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Sneak preview there. Um, B is Byzantine art, which I mean, everyone needs to know more about Christian art than they already know. It is pretty much like <laughs> the one of the most covered topics we do. But um, Byzantine art is a body of Christian Greek artistic production. It's come out of the Byzantine era um, empire. Um, it's religious as hell. They cannot get enough of their Christianity. They absolutely love it. It is mainly mosaics, um, frescoes, panel paintings, and all of them are like Christian, uh, Christian rhetoric. This was because in the 13th century, the Pope was trying to really retain his power as being the center of Christianity in the West. And, so they just like made loads and loads of things with gold, ivory, precious metals, and a shit ton of embellishment, literally all over. Um, C is caliphs. So caliphs means successor in Arabic, which is the history of the ruler of the Muslim community. Ruler of the Muslims community, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> I'm gonna focus on the, very briefly on the, um, Umayyad dynasty and the Ab Abbasid dynasty. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing them wrong. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know. Because um, Islamic art is such a wide topic and very, very like interesting and expansive. So um, yeah, um, the Umayyad Caliph was the first, one of the first 
Islamic dynasties and they basically just needed worship places, books, things like that. So naturally all of their artistic production was to do with their religion and creating things like the Dome of the Rock, which is the blue building, which you see on the screen. It is like the, one of the most beautiful religious buildings then ever has been created. Um, and then Abba said they like took on, they'd already established Islamic art. So they took on like decorative stone and wood and ceramics. And they use like luster painting, which is the um, two pots that you can see on here. These are like beautiful. They really tried to embellish everything after the, in this period. Um, trying to move the slides. Okay, D is for Dada. Um, Dada is an art movement formed during um, World War I in Zurich as a negative reaction to the horrors of war. Um, it was basically satirical and nonsensical um, in nature. They, as you can see here, it's very all over the place, very crazy. And they basically just wanted to replace the, everything that was old with something new, which is why like war brought into question everything in society. And, and you can see here the painting of Mona Lisa with like the mustache and things. That was by um, Marcel Duchamp, which is called L-H-O-O-Q, which um, the initials pronounced by native Fre French speakers would translate to, she has a hot ass. So <laughs> that is pretty like, little, just, yeah. yeah. That is basically taking the mess out of all classical painters and everything to do with them. Um, the next one is Egyptian art. What a classic. Um, this is basically painting, sculptures, drawings on papyrus, um, jewelry, all that sort of stuff. Um, Egyptian society was based on the concept of harmony. Um, they just loved being like one with nature and one with the universe and art was seen as a, a based on the perfect balance of all of this within the ideal world of the gods. So it was not meant to be seen by normal people and it was like too powerful to be seen by the public. So I assume you just explode when you saw these things in real life <laughs> or that's what they told people. Um, the next one, you've probably heard of this one. This is, a, I mean, a pretty big one. It's a very big period for Western art. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, it was in the 15th century. Um, it was this, Florence was the center of all artistic production at the time. And it means, Renaissance means rebirth. So it was the movement from the dark ages into the intellectual, like new civilization. And they focused on maths perspective, science, anatomy, and created such wealth in the city through like families like the Medici family who boosted like industries and things like that. So you can see here, we've got all the beautiful paintings that everyone knows and loves, but then we've also got, oh, hang on. Okay. Yeah, we've got all those beautiful things there. Okay. G, golden age, Dutch. See, well, I couldn't think of G, so this is what we've gone with. <laughs> um, um, in the Netherlands, um, from the birth of the um, Dutch Republic to 1672, um, there was massive wealth, massive trade. It was like bringing immigrants and money and all that sort of good stuff. Um, religious paintings were not at the forefront. They were like, no, hell no, we are moving away from that. We do not want to deal with that. So instead they depicted life, real people, landscapes, all that sort of stuff until 1672, which was called the disaster year. It did not go well for the Dutch in that year. Basically everything was ruined. The French and English attacked and their prime minister died and it was all over and they just, that was it for them. Um, the next one. Oh, it's not doing it. Sorry, guys. This is the Harlem Renaissance, literally amazing. Um, intellectual, artistic and social explosion in Harlem in the 1920s. It was a mecca for black culture and um, due to the great migration in the early 1900s. So in 1920, 300,000 African-Americans moved from the, from the South to the North to get better life prospects and just a better like quality of life in general. Um, and so places like Harlem were set up as like safe havens for the black community. 
and they set up civil rights groups, jazz clubs, bars, and it was just full of like artistic expression and all that amazing stuff. So, okay, click it first. Okay, this is Inca art, probably like not one of the most like well-known art movements. Um, it was in Peru in the 15th and 16th century, and they did like me metal, ceramics, textiles, all of that stuff. Um, because textiles was a symbol of wealth and status. So they used it as tax and money. Um, they had different meanings yeah. for their all like. Hang on. No? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, they had different meanings for all their colors. Like red was rulership, green, <laughs> agriculture, black was death. And um, yeah, all that stuff. In the 16th century though, obviously this happens everywhere. European invaders, um, they stole all Incan goods, they melted them down, they discouraged tradition, and they basically destroyed everything, which was terrible and a running theme throughout history, basically. Um, fun fact, Emperor's New Groove is based on Incan society, but I don't know how accurate that is to the real Incan society. It is a pretty good movie, though. Um, the next one is Japanese Buddhism. So this is a thing that's studied in first year and it's just very interesting. Um, it's so symbolic and has so much culture in it. Um, basically the story of the Buddha, he was born immaculate conception into wealth, leaves and he's protected his whole life, can't leave the palace, leaves one day, sees reality, goes, you know, I'm just gonna like meditate under a tree three days, leaves his wife, leaves I'm his really child. Yeah, we've all been in that mindset where we just want to leave our child and wife and <laughs> go <laughs> meditate under a tree. Um, and he tried to find a path to break the cycle of suffering in the world. And him dying really inspired a lot of people who'd have thought it. Um, he normally is seen with like shell, um, snail shell hair and long ears and all this stuff you can see with the gold butter on the left. And they were also obsessed with heaven and hell. They, they like really wanted you to think about what was going to happen after you died. So they had the monks lived a monastic life free of sins and they even mummified themselves. So as you can see in the bottom right, um, they said they starved and dehydrated themselves so they could rid their body of moisture, got inside um, statues and basically died and buried alive in these tombs that is i mean that is dedication to the utmost degree <laughs> and they also had hungry ghosts which were horrible creatures which they said were people that had sins and they ate poo and like were just constantly hungry and thirsty and i cannot imagine that life so that is <laughs> that is the japanese buddhism korean art um beautiful period um the, the, this is mainly from the, this is going to be a really bad pronounce, um, jo, Joseon dynasty, um, which was the golden age of Korean um, painting and lasted until the collapse of the Ming dynasty. Um, they are moved away from religion and built, was built on like a social and ethical philosophy. And they wanted anti-Buddhism measures to reduce the wealth and influence that the Buddhist monasteries had. Um, so they repressed Buddhism. Um, yeah, basically, they had identity that, like, the Koreans merged identity, and they. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just checking <laughs> on my notes. Um, they also loved landscapes, so they had true view landscapes. Yeah, sorry. Um, and you can see here as like the beautiful blue one, and then the one at the front on the left is called um, the Di View of the Diamond Mountains, which is a Korean national treasure. It's really beautiful. Um, landscape art, French landscape art is one of the most ones. It From the 1800s, 1900s, massive change. Went from realism, which was like people being like poor and hard done by, you can see in the top right and the bottom left. They are like beautiful pieces and they rejected classism and focused on everyday life and then this changed to the impressionism impressionists of the 19th century they moved forward they were forward thinking they were looking at urban settings untraditional cover um, um untraditional color 
loose brush strokes and abandons traditional perspectives and all of that. Um, doing that wrong. Okay. M is for Mesopotamia. <laughs> We're going right back to the start here, guys. The OG artists um, really were the early hunter gatherers, um, referred to as the cradle of civilization and place where the, the society first started, human society, and it was meant to honor the gods and goddesses that ruled over different aspects of nature. It was mainly clay, metal, stone, reliefs, and sculptures. The, I mean, the anatomy and the accuracy weren't their strong points, but they have a rich narrative. And as you can see, it was kind of early porn. There's like a couple in the middle, very sexually charged, kind of early porn, but you know, they've got to hand it to them. It was very impressive back in the day, little tools, they didn't have much. Um, this is the halfway point, so you'll be happy to know. <laughs> I'm trying to get through these so you can learn as much as possible. N is for neoclassicism. Neoclassicism was dominated by the big cheese of the 19th century, <laughs> Napoleon. Um, it came into power in the wake of the French Revolution, and um, this was a, t a return to classical values, brotherhood, nationalism, male power. We love that. We didn't see enough of male power in the past. It was great. It came back. Um, <laughs> um, classical iconography can be seen across all aspects of these paintings. And um, yeah, just basically loved the traditional styles. Um, next one. O is for op art, so optical art. Um, this was coined in 1964 to describe abstract artworks that created optical illusions, um, progressed from paintings to drawings to full scale sculptures. And they, I'm, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty impressed by the fact that they can turn one item, like one piece of artwork and completely transform it into something that looks totally different, which is pretty amazing. Um, R is for Romanticism. Um, it's, this is a new movement of art, philosophy, literature. Um, its definition comes from the Baudelaire in 1846, um, and it's break from neoclassicism for, that I've just described, and is far more difficult to class, um, but generally defined as rejection of classicism, use of cu current um, events, political e um, emphasis and then the role of the man which again we love um yeah the the ideals that romanticism projected of fighting for the rights of the people and a deep care for nature was yeah um that's really relevant right now with the rise of like protesting for climate change and things like that which is really cool um p is for psychedelic art um um uh, this is where man started to look towards their own consciousness, um, mainly driven by, <laughs> by the main dude, Freud. Um, he literally drove everything. Um, this people took psychedelic drugs like acid and MDMA and the creation of art with their minds and the movement fully emerged into the 1960s with rock bands and um, creating covers with b bizarre shapes and strange faces. And um, it's a really underappreciated era, era of art with a lot of interesting ideas. Um, yeah, basically. Um, Q is for queens. Yes, we love those type of queens. Um, although you could argue like, no, we're not talking about those queens just now, but you could argue that they did create their own whole form of artwork and they've really influenced um, modern society. So um, art history has a lot of male, pale and stale, artists <laughs> and it's like there's been so many great artists and female rulers dating back to ne Nefertiti and our own Elizabeth I the main woman she has created such a vivid, vivid image for herself but she did kind of use 17th century photoshop because she didn't really look like that she just bribed the uh, painter I assume <laughs> um s surrealism extremely famous movement Famous artists, Frida Kahlo, Salvador Dali, Rennie Magritte. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> um, yeah, you've probably heard of all of these. These are like main people. Um, they driven by the urge to display, sorry, um, to display images from dream and the crevices of the human mind. So, you know, it gets pretty deep. Um, it's spread across all art forms, painting, 
film, sculpture, you name it, they probably did it. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's, it's pretty weird, but pretty wonderful at the same time. Um, T, Taiwan. That's probably pretty underappreciated art scene, especially here in the UK, but there is an entire Taiwanese town called the Rainbow Towan, um, which is painted by Huang Yong Fu over a 10 year period. And the village is completely um, like full of color and life and it's brought so much to tourism and the art, the town is flourishing. So, you know, art can really help everything. Um, uh, you is urban graffiti. Um, this is, was used to be thought of as just simply vandalism, but now Banksy and things like that have brought graffiti into like, uh, like become an art form on like political protest um, against fascism and right wing leadership and to aid in the fight against um, environmental extinction. It's also sometimes a hilarious addition to a wall and it is moved from the annoyance from young children into like an art form that can like reach millions and is so powerful to everything. Um, v, did struggle with V, but we got to go with Venus, um, the most beautiful goddess of them all. Who could leave her out? Um, just beautiful all around. You can see just, you know, bask in that glory. Um, moving on to a bit of a downer here. W, war art, not great. Um, from 1900s to 1990, 43 million people died in war. That is astonishing, considering that um, previous to 1914, the highest recorded deaths was 50, um, 150,000, which is a pretty big leap. And so it's not surprising people took to art to really like think about their ideas and you know understand them, the darkest moments. And these can be seen in all the things all the paintings and things that you can see here and the viewpoints of um, different people in, that saw our um, war and, you know, displaying images beyond, beyond the comprehension of true human destruction. A really, a really happy topic I've got there for you guys. Um, X is for, X marks the spot. This is the spot we're at. We're gonna move on because you're probably trying to get through this all the same way I am. <laughs> um, y is for, why did I choose to do the A to Z to art history? I'm completely running out of ideas, um, but here's a really sexy picture of God from the Sistine Chapel. We've got to love the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> yes, definitely wolf whistle. <laughs> and then Z is for, you're probably really tired, so we'll leave it there for the past of art history. There's a lot to cover. I've covered a lot. There's like so much stuff you can look at, but all of it very interesting. So that is the past of art history. And I think um, Annie is now going to give you the present. And yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks so much to Megan. That was really a lot to cover. Wow. <laughs> Congrats. The whole history. Yeah, that was like almost. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to talk about next. <laughs> yeah, after this, so that was the past. So that was like the history of the art. Now we're going to like the, the present and the future. I don't know what's happening. So I'm really excited for these ladies to enlighten us. Um, let me, oh, let me stop sharing. Uh, so yeah, that was amazing. Oh, like, thank you so much. Let me make sure no one's waiting outside. Oh, people are clapping in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Wow. What a, what a whirlwind. Okay, so now um, I'm going to show you another cocktail video to introduce the present. And then our fabulous Annie is going to talk about the present. So let's see if I can play the right video this time.
lockdown, I've been having a deconstructed French 75 with some Prosecco. And I like to add a shot of gin. Hi everyone, I hope you are uh, related to that on a deeper level since lockdown. Uh, <laughs> hope you got a kick out of that. That was me alone in my house so when we get drunk. So uh, next we're going to introduce uh, our lovely Annie to talk about the present. So um, I'm going to share her slides first and then she's going to come on. Here we go. Hello there. I'm Annie. Well, I don't like, I don't like that. You don't need it, it's okay. Don't need it. Okay, so I am going to be talking about Contemporary Art Today. Um, yeah, uh, lot to say about it. Let's, let's jump in. We love contemporary art. It's great. These are some of my favorite contemporary artists. We've got Jenny Saville, Tracy Emmons, Lubiana Himid, and Takashi Muramaki. It makes your grandma go, hmm, Annie, you could have made that when you were three. <laughs> and we love to see it. However, it's not all good. I have three main beefs with the contemporary art world. Number one, men with overinflated egos. Number two, institutional ethics and inaccessibility. And three, white supremacy. Um, yeah men with overinflated egos. So, Linda Nocklin, what would you say? Why would you say there aren't any great women artists? Don't have a microphone, so I'm gonna use a mask. <laughs> Wait, that's the microphone. <laughs> I mean... You shouldn't pick it up, but... Well, Annie, I'm Lisa Nocklin. <laughs> and I would say the f few main reasons why there aren't many great women artists. Absolutely all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's her. Um, number one. Throughout women, his women, throughout that history, <laughs> throughout women. <laughs> That's so not great. Throughout women, history. <laughs> throughout history, this is this is not me speaking. This is Linda Nocklin, by the way. Yeah. Um, throughout she history, women <laughs> were just seen as worse artists than men, and this has trickled into modern art, where women artists were not seen uh, seen as a different category to men artists, and not even necessarily worse, but. If we look at the way that women are presented in contemporary art spaces, it's still that sort of different category. I'm gonna put Linda's microphone down now. <laughs> um, as well, men are being, men are always the classic examples of artists that are part of a movement. Um, and women are presented as women artists that are part of a movement. Um, so if you look to like Dadaism, you've got the classic men, and then you've got like Hannah Hoff, who's like, the women, the female Dada artists, you know, it's not, it's a different category. Um, historically, there was a lower level of education for women, which not only prevented women from reaching their true artistic potential, but also conditioned them and the general public into believing that women artists just weren't as good. Um, and we can take the artist's genius mindset as an example of that, with like the comparison between the presentation of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo to Artemisia, Artemisia Gentilesi. You know, they're, they're not seen as the same. Um, and perhaps due to the social conditioning, um, due to the levels of education that women have experienced um, and making them seem less capable as men, art historians have written less about women artists than they have about men. Even when there is a survey of art history such as Gombrich's The Story of Art, um, which 
perpetuates the fact that women are just not as successful in the art worlds of the past. Um, and yeah, but you ask. Oh, how is this relevant to contemporary art? So if you look at back to recent movements in art, most main members are men. So 1960s modernism, you think Andy Warhol, Jackson Pollock, um, and they've been written about more. Um, but now institutions are realizing the mistakes of their past and including more women artists. But personally, I don't know, this effort to include more women almost perpetrates the trope that women fall under another artistic category than men. Um, it seems almost self-conscious on the part of the galleries. Um, but how do we break these tropes? How do we get around that? But yeah. Men with huge egos in the art world. They are systemic. Um, throughout history, men have either subconsciously or consciously chosen to play into the no great women artist trope. That would be the only way to gain success, you know, to recognize um, their place within society and play into that. But then we get men parading around and coming from a place of inauthenticity. Oh, I can't say that word. In inauthenticity. In Creating art. <laughs> I hate, hate Jeff Koons. I hate him. Um, he is the personification of consumerism meeting the art world. Um, he has a massive factory of artists working for him, um, creating the art for him. You know, where are the ethics there? It's his idea. Is he the one actually creating the work? Is that inauthentic? Um, and he quickly turns the work out and sells them for a high, pi high price. Um, he makes art for what the consumers want without a meaning or a message. I'll let you ponder the ethics of that. Okay. Beef number two with the contemporary art world. Institutional ethics. So, the museums of the past were declining in the 1970s and then they became profit machines. Um, I'm not saying that the old style, the non representative representational museums were fab but now they are focused on the spectacle and with a focus on architecture and possible urban regeneration that new art galleries bring so seen in the slide is the vna dundee um, which is a prime example of this um, with less gallery space and more about what the museum can bring to the area and the consumerist commercial element of a gallery um, there are close correlations between retails and museum not even art is immune to capitalism, sad. Um, so the second picture on this slide is the MoMA in New York, the Museum of Modern Art. Um, in the late 1960s, the Art Workers Coalition, otherwise known as the AWC, and the Guerrilla Art Action Group against, were against the MoMA in particular. The AWC believed that a truly democratic public institution had to have a board made of trustees that reflected the general population and not an elite minority. Um, Rosia says, the board of trustees who are often made up of wealthy big collectors have massive leverage with curators and gallery directors because of the cash flow they bring um, and therefore push the biases, their biases and values into the art world. So the, the um, kind of uh, vision and the message of the art galleries are based on who can buy art and who is more likely to be wealthy in society in general, um, like the governing group of society kind of rule the art world. Um, and then we move on to, I think it's the next slide. Yes, art as cultural capital, it's an interesting concept. Um, expensive art being created, intended to only be investments for the uber wealthy. So we've got the famous fabulous banana on the wall. Um, I think it's Comedian by Maurizio Catalan. Fiona has a, you have a, you have an edition of it on your wall? Yeah. yeah. Oh, just on my kitchen sink. Just above her kitchen sink. <laughs> you can see it in the castle. Yeah, Fiona bought that for $120,000. Yeah, yeah. Exact yeah, yeah, yeah. same banana. We're exact same banana. banana. No, in the, in the actual artwork, it says in the directions, replace banana periodically. Yeah. 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 It's, it's weird. Art has got weird. Um, and my question to you is, is art, accessible if it's only understandable after a 30-minute lecture or a degree in fine art um 
Am I beefing con conceptual art? Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> but also being an artist is inacceptable, in, inaccept inaccessible for most people. Um, you have to have a certain level of wealth to enter the artistic career. Um, you have, which means that institutions like art schools are disproportionately made up of students from wealthy backgrounds. Um, which means the artistic values and interests of those socially and economically advanced individuals filters into the general contemporary art world. Um, but is this a issue with institutions or with the current status of art? Are institutions furthering this? Um, is this an issue with con contemporary art being funneled into private galleries? Or is it with the inaccessibility of institutions for emerging artists? Now, white supremacy in the contemporary art world. Historically, non-Western art has been seen as exotic or primitive, with the subtext being that non-white pieces of art aren't as good, that they aren't on the same level of quality as fine art. This is seen through the lens of colonialism with a different category to white art. And this is exactly what Nocklin said about women being seen as a different category of artists than white men. Um, which brings up similar questions of if it's patronizing when, women, when museums are self-conscious and specifically make a point about including artists of color. Does it acknowledge the previous tropes of different categories of art depending on race and gender? So kind of, is it, is it bad that it's, their artists of color are being presented as they are? Should they just be part of the art institutions? And yeah, they should be obviously. But let's talk about, oh, that was a snake freak. Let's talk about decolonizing collections and museums. So decolonizing is a way of strategically seeing the present curatorial habits as without authority um, and without having their um, values based on colonialism. Um, it's basically, Decolonization is basically a strategy of examining curatorial practices and taking away their authority, which removes any colonial values that they have made that have made their way into modern curation from the contemporary art world. Um, so a writer called Mertzov has called for creating spaces where you're willing to be challenged to make new higher to make new institutions without hierarchies. Um, and a space that embraces the necessity of decolonization, an institution that doesn't reproduce white supremacy. Um, so an example of white supremacy in the contemporary art world. Actually, no, we're going to go. I hate Andy Warhol, right? <laughs> Woo! Again, life Jeff Koons with the producing art in a factory. The ethics of that, not the best. Um, but also he exploited black trans women of color in this series that you can see, it's called Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, he exoticized and dehumanized them under the guise of liberation. So he would go to areas where he knew black trans women would be hanging around, drag queens as well. Um, he'd get them to sit for hundreds and hundreds of Polaroids and prints. He'd pay them $50. Um, and then he'd sell these prints for hundreds of thousands or however much. Um, there's a quote I read from Marsha Mar Pree Johnson, who was really influential on the Stonewall riots. Um, and she was basically like, oh, it's so weird going, walking past a gallery in New York, seeing a print of my face and still struggling to get my next meal. Um, so that's, it's really bad. And I mean, only, it was only a couple of years ago that Andy Warhol actually named, or they were named the, um, the drag queens and the black trans women of color in this. Like he took all of the fame um, off of these women. He exploited them. But in the contemporary art world, an example of white supremacy is Mark Quinn's statue of Jen Reed. It's meant to be, um, it's meant to present her as an activist and hero of the BLM movement. Um, but behind the scenes, he was exploiting her to make money and to be successful as an artist. He was taking nude pictures of her, wouldn't let, them, wouldn't let her see them, um, basically took the rights to her as a person, um, which is completely against the nature of BLM. But 
that's what he did. And that's an example of white supremacy in the contemporary art world. And anyway, to end this all, my answer. Anarchy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And there you have it, the contemporary art world. <laughs> Oh my god that was an amazing talk wow Legend. you really covered like every topic every controversy that was that was incredible annie thank you so much um everyone everyone please give applause to annie in the chat that was really amazing oh my gosh that was really good i can't believe that was great i like i we've had lectures that have like barely touched that iceberg so that was really awesome. And this year, like a lot of those things you mentioned happened this year. So like, if you guys think about it, we are the next art historians. Like we're writing future textbooks and articles about art history. And, you know, it's shaped by the people who write it. And hopefully in the future, it's less full of white men or, you know, more balanced at least. So that was really fantastic. I'm just checking that everything's working properly. Great. Okay, cool. So now we're going to do future next. I'm going to show you another quick cocktail video. So this will be a twist on the classic French 75 that you saw earlier. Um, and then Clem's going to come on and give our last talk. So. Greetings. T -t 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 Today, I'll show you how to make a Apocalypse 75. I used to drink the classic French 75, but now I prefer the Apocalypse 75, as I like to call it. It's similar to, to the classic cocktail, but a bit bitter and it's tinged red, a bit like the skies outside. Start by adding ice to your shaker. Then add 50 milliliters of gin. Twenty-five milliliters of fresh lemon juice. Fifty milliliters of simple syrup. and 25 millimeters of the blood of the innocent. If you're out, Campari works great too. Beautiful. Now, close that up and shake it all together for about 20 seconds. I never actually count to 20. I do count, but I don't count to 20 for some reason. And then strain that into your glass. Garnish with a little lemon twist. And I like to serve it with a shot of Prosecco. Cheers. <sighs> Cheers. My hands are so sticky. Making this in the past with gloves is actually so much better because you don't get the simple syrup or the lemon juice on your on your hands. Oh.
Oh my god. If I didn't care more than words can say. If you just joined, please mute yourself. Thanks. I hope you all enjoyed that. So that was the Apocalypse 75. We've also posted the recipes for all of these on the Facebook and we'll post the, well, we post these videos later so you can make these cocktails yourself. Um, and I hope you do. It's actually really good. The Campari is a bit bitter, but this cocktail is great. I hope you make it. Apollonia came up with this. So I hope you like it. Next, we'll be introducing Clem to talk about the future of art. I'm gonna share her slides and then she can come on. Everyone give it up for Clem. Hello, queens, kings, <laughs> and non-binary legends. I'm, yes, I exist. Okay, so, yes. Okay, so this is the future of art. Let's begin. Uh, thanks, Amy and Megan, for talking about the past and the present about institutions. Those are all relevant to the future, obviously. So I'm gonna start with a fun fact. Um, the future of art lies in technology. Fun fact. Um, I decided to do that because I realized that university is just a bunch of fun facts. And they were like, this is your degree in art. <laughs> but it's just fun facts. So this one, I think is pretty interesting. In the scene is, it's October, 2018. Chris is New York famous auction house, right? They sold a print called Edmund de Bellamy for half a mil, okay? Which, you know, I guess, whatever. It's art, they do that all the time. Um, it was made by the French collective Obvious, just a bunch of French dudes. Um, and you're like, cool, you know, it's a, basically it's an AI generated print, which is sick. However, we have beef with that because Christie's and Obvious they basically ripped off a 19 year old called Robbie Barrett. Let me introduce you to him. Basically, a Robbie Barrett is a cool American teenager who believes that the future of art lies in technology, right? And that it should be accessible. So basically he created an AI called Gan and he was like, here it is on the internet for you to use for free. Basically you feed Gan a set of data. It could be anything for Edmund de Bellamy, they used like a thousand and five hundred European 19th century portraits, right? So you feed it to it. And basically, again, it's so smart that it goes, it comes through all those portraits and it creates one that is the ultimate picture. It's so good that Gan can't even distinguish that from the pictures it's been fed. So this is the picture. This is Edmund Bellamy. Anyway, we have beef with that because Robbie Barrett came up with that put it on the internet, was that like, you can use it. And then Christie's and a bunch of French dudes come and they sell a print for half a mil. And here you have the exact dichotomy and the exact problem with art institutions right now. And the problem is we obviously don't want that to continue in the future, right? We want people like Robbie Barrett who believe in technology and accessibility because that is so important for the future of art. Now, ladies and gentlemen and non barry legends, we get into the intersection of technology and activism because the future of art also lies in activism. So why am I talking about this intersection? Uh, basically, in the wake of really important movements like Me Too and BLM, there has been a lot of content created right? And all of this content put on social media platforms, use of these new techno technologies, they're changing the landscape of art as we see it right now. Um, and hopefully forever, you know, and hopefully making art more inclusive and fluid and diverse. Um, and here I include a quote by the art activist Jeffrey Hayes, who's an all around legend. Basically, this is her vision. I basically how this is going to work is I have about three people's point of view on the future of art. So she says, I imagine in 20 years, 
um, art will be much more fluid than it is today in the sense of boundaries being collapsed between media, between the kinds of art that is labeled as art um, in the traditional sense. I also see it being much more re representative of our growing demographics uh, and of our growing and shifting demographics. So more artists of color, more female identified works and everything in between. Now, this is sick and it's really cool. Um, but so yeah, so we, we, you know, we want with in the wake of big world events, we want art to continue on the path that is on right now, more diverse uh, and more inclusive, right? Um, sorry. <laughs> On top of that, Hayes also has this idea that because we're experiencing as a society such important world events that our art would also become more group based and less individual. So that's also important to keep in mind. The idea that art will, first of all, not necessarily be recognizable, um, but also that it will be more of a, you know, a conscious thing that we make together. Um, and now we get into another perspective by Modu Dieng, who's a really sick dude. He is, um, sorry, he is a curator and an artist. And I included a quote of what he thinks, you know, because this is how the presentation works. So he says, the future of art is black. Today, African, African-American, Afro-European and Afro-Latin artists trending globally marked by an opening to African diaspora uh, artists working with discourses beyond, and that's really important, beyond the black body and colonialism. Black abstraction, creating and performance are all center stage. And this is sick because basically um, he's saying, you know, beyond decolonizing the art curriculum, we're putting black conceptual art at the forefront. Um, and so with this, we see that these changes that Hayes and Jiang are, you know, they're, they're predicting. This doesn't mean that black and female and outsider art are emerging right now. They have rich histories. It means that they truly believe that these perspectives will be totally embraced by the markets and institutions and what makes our art world, uh, which will hopefully change, change themselves. And so the, uh, what we hope is that art and its institution will themselves um, be more diverse and less focused on the classic Eurocentric so-called canon of art, basically what Megan and Annie were talking about, the pale male sale shit. We, we're done with that. Um, and so it's really important to think that this can happen and these visions can happen with the meddling and the intersection of technology and activism. The pro, oh, I think, oh, we have a pro my last two slides aren't included. Oh, sorry. That's not a problem. I'll just continue with, you know, what I was saying. The problem is that not everyone likes this idea of art and technology creating a new kind of art that's collective because white men have beef with that because, you know, it's the whole like art for art's sake thing. The idea that Art doesn't have anything to do with activism and we would, don't want that. Um, I think that's ludicrous because you can't expect art to be a, you know, a separate cultural entity from art world. We're not in Plato's you know, idea of universes. Um, art is us and art is influenced by its frameworks. You can't possibly have only art for art's sake. So basically it's just white men being annoyed at women and artists of color making change. Um, and my last I idea um, is that we're the, what we anticipate will be the future of art is only anticipation. We have no clue um, what, you know, what's gonna happen, climate change. We maybe we'll, we'll be dead in like six years. You know, this is basically we're trying to anticipate, anticipate post-Anthropocene art. Now, the Anthropocene, if you're not familiar, is the current geological age, ge geological age that we're in, uh, where all of Earth has been touched by man. And one of the biggest effects of that is climate change and the lack of resources. Um, 
so maybe we're all gonna die and maybe we won't have any art and maybe who gives a fuck about art if you know we're all dying but that's basically the gist of the future of art thank you yeah <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Oh. Caroline, take it away. Take yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Sorry for looking like Mortis your Adams. Um, I'm going to read, I'm not going to read that. Um, I'm Caroline. I'm the president, and I've been doing tech support in that chair over there. So, any breakages, badness, terrible things that have happened, that's all down to me, blame me. I've also been spending most of this uh, last half an hour tagging Jeff Coons and Banksy on Instagram, calling them out. Jeff Coon and Kate, very uh, funny. Absolutely, honestly, I mean, I think the next one should go for like Elon Musk or something, be like, <laughs> hashtag release Grimes, you know, like give her back to us. Like, you know, you don't need a we do for the art. Um, yeah, this has been, really really good i mean i'm very lucky in that i have a really really great team this year i'm leading on from apollonia last year who was she was my god if you've ever seen if you've ever seen like a russian spy in a bond film oh i'm gonna get given the cocktail thank you so this much is the apocalypse 75. this is the apocalypse 75 this means that i'm gonna just be like dead in an alleyway in like half an hour That is strong. I like it. Oh. Yeah. Apollonia is our beautiful Russian president from last year. She is the ultimate Bond girl. However, she's now going to Glasgow to do law. Who does law? Honestly, everyone knows that the future is art history. Um, yeah, so I'm in charge for this year, and you've been listening to the wonderful works of Annie and Clem, and everyone has been and just. Megan. I'm, I'm Megan. Megan the legend. I called you Meg. <laughs> Wait, do you prefer Megan or Meg? Megan Italian. Meg, yeah, Megan I'm Meg, Italian. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I went backwards and it was meant to be like Meg, Annie, Clem, and it was like Annie, Clem, Meg. <laughs> I'm getting distracted by alcohol. I'm so sorry. I'm just, you, do, you, do you want to come oh, join yeah. in? Don't worry. We, so we're just having some extra mini cocktails. Absolutely. By the way, if you make the um, Apocalypse 75, we like to serve it with a shot of Prosecco. It's also nice because if the cocktail is too bitter for your taste, you can top it off with the Prosecco. Mm -hmm. So, would recommend. I'll just drink the whole Prosecco beforehand and then go on the cocktail. Either one. It's, it's, it's a choose your adventure of alcoholism. This is why I'm on that side of the camera rather than this side of the camera because I'm just like, ah, get drunk, do what you want. It's fine. Well, I think this has been a very successful drunk art history, if I do say so myself. I think it's been really good. Thank you very much oh. for your hard work. Thanks. And all of you guys over there. Round of applause. And thank you to everyone who's coming. Thank you for everyone who came, everyone who's watching on YouTube. Also, if you tell your friends about this and they missed it, we're going to save it and post it on YouTube so you can watch it later. We might edit it into little bite-sized videos too so thank you all for coming also follow us on facebook twitter instagram we're going to be doing more events through the whole year we're going to be doing academic support more fun silly stuff like this and like all of the above so definitely hit us up you can message up message us on facebook or anything if you have questions and here's to i hope you all have a great first week of uni next week i know how exciting that's so that? exciting i know this is a weird time but really like enjoy your classes ask questions have a good time but yeah you're gonna also everyone who's on the zoom right now are all university students so if you want to like you want to connect with people feel free to drop your instagram or twitter in the chat if you want people to reach out to you i know it's really hard to make friends right now so i recommend that but otherwise, thank you so much and good night. Mwah. Bye.